So everyone, uh, you know these two people. Um, Mike Birbiglia is a famous stand-up comedian. He was turned filmmaker. Um, this movie is based on his one-man show of the same name, Sleepwalk With Me. And Ira Glass is the producer and host of This American Life. Please welcome to the stage, Mike Birbiglia and Ira Glass. Thanks. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thanks for coming. How are you? Thanks, Brendan. Do you want right. to? Uh, yeah, wait, no, I get We didn't decide in advance who's going to sit closer to Brendan. Well, you're the filmmaker, writer, star, director. I feel like you naturally but need you to be closer. You have a popular radio show that everyone loves. <laughs> I'm the unknown comedian. I know, but I'm the sideman in this project. Okay, I guess so. Okay. You're both here and featured, so it's okay. <sighs> thanks for having us here. It feels so evil. It just, I don't know what it is. Like the word evil just pops to my mind when I'm here. Oh uh, man, there are no lawyers here, right? So, okay, I see a few in the back. They're not listening. Um, so guys, thanks for coming again. Um, thanks. We're talking about the movie Sleepwalk with me, which I watched last night. It's a great movie. Um, thanks. It started out, as I mentioned, is Mike's one man show. Uh, was ran to rave reviews, sold out Bleecker Street Theater for a I few months. I just want to point out that she's yeah. videoing the show like this with her phone going like <laughs> this, someone in the fourth row, which I thought was a funny tripod. <laughs> it's just kind of this. It's a very unreliable tripod. Is your hands in the stick the landing gymnast pose. Yeah, it's more of a bipod than a tripod. Yeah, it's a bipod. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the show ran for eight months, sold out Bleecker Street Theater, was produced by Nathan Lane. Um, and then you turned that into a book. That's right. Um, and would you mind just giving us the cliff notes of how the movie came into being? You know, it transformed from this one-man show to a book. In I'm gonna. Film. I would answer this, but whenever I answer anything and Ira's around, he just starts like steamrolling whatever I'm saying mid-sentence, <laughs> and he goes, nah, "This is how. This is how we explain it." <laughs> and then he just starts going, and this so, so I'm just going to throw to you out of the gate. <laughs> how did it happen, Ira? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember. Me neither. <laughs> Here's what happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, uh, when you have a Broadway or off-Broadway show that Ex is extended a bunch, you know, like it extended a bunch of times. Inevitably, everyone you know says, you should make this a movie. This is apparently uh, something I didn't know beforehand. And I was, I've been writing screenplays since I was in college. Like, that's what I studied in school. And I'd always wanted to make films, but I essentially couldn't afford it, is the long, is the short version. And then um, around this time, the show was really successful, and I, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to write the film for, for this company that we didn't end up making the film with, but it kind of amicably parted ways eventually. But that's when I started writing the film, and I asked Ira, would you want to be a producer? And then along the way, he worked on it so much that in the process, he became one of the writers as well. And so it, 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 was, it took a lot longer than we thought. And yeah. uh, you know, that, started, that process started in 2008, and that we shot the film in 2011. We and started working on the movie in 2008? Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, 2009. Wow. The play opened in 2008, and then in 2009 we started the script. And then, okay. So I guess two years later, we, we shot the film. Um, and just sort of a backstory, Mike had appeared. Awesome. <laughs> um, Mike had appeared on This American Life a few times uh, leading up to when you guys started making the movie. Um, how did you guys meet each other originally or start working with each other? I mean, we met each other because Mike had actually told this story uh, at the Moth, uh, the storytelling, uh, uh, you know, open mic, open, oh, it's not really an open mic, storytelling show. And I heard a recording and, and thought it would be great on the radio and called him up and that's the first time we met. And then since then we we collaborated on a bunch of stories together and and that we put on the radio. And when we do it, like you'll have an idea for a story and we'll sketch something out and then and then we have a process of working on it that's very different from other writers on the show where, where Mike will go on stage and perform a version of the story and make a little MP3 and email it to me. And then that night or the next morning, we'll go over, okay, what worked, what didn't work, what could be, you know, where should we fill stuff out, where could we have another joke, what jokes aren't working, and we'll do that five or six or seven times. Uh, and then at the end, have, have a piece that then we'll record full fidelity and, and very prettily and, 
and put on the radio. Well, that's interesting. So, Mike, you said you were a, went for college and you studied screenwriting. Ira, have you been a film buff? I mean, you've been in radio more or less. I am not a career. film buff at all. Like, I, I go to the movies. I enjoy. I'm a completely civilian movie consumer. <laughs> In every way. But that, you're, you have an IMDb entry now, so now you're a filmmaker. Does that weird you out? No, that seems awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that seems really awesome. Um, and we have, we, like, the, the radio show uh, has had, since 2002, various projects that people have tried to make into movies and that have been in development with various directors. And one of them actually got made, Paul Feig, who did Freaks and Geeks and, and uh, Bridesmaids, made one of them into a film years ago. Uh, but I wasn't so, we weren't so involved in that. He just kind of like took an idea and made it into a, a film, a film called Unaccompanied Minors, a kid's Christmas movie, and uh, which I felt I had no, no expertise to bring to that. <laughs> and uh, so this is the first film that I've really been so super involved in. You know yeah. what I noticed looking at the audience of Google employees? No one's old. <laughs> <laughs> old. You're not old. old. How old? You're not old. I'm older than you. Yeah, I'm way, way older than you. <laughs> you beat your ass. Solid, <laughs> hardcore 50 right here. More than that. <laughs> no, no one's older than you, right? I, I doubt it. You're 46. Anybody older than 46? Do we have a 47? <laughs> Do I see a 48? 49. See, but this isn't news to them. Like, like, I know it's news to me. <laughs> Breaking news all. You thought it was going to be a lot of old people? I thought it was going to be an elderly technology company. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a home for hobbyists, <laughs> technology hobbyists who, who want to compete with Apple. What's the internet service like in this building? Is it decent? You guys get a good signal? You guys get a T3 around here? <laughs> like, like, is it like so unbelievably fast that when you go home, it's not even worth going on the internet? Like, <laughs> you just have to touch no someone is, in this building, and you're on the internet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one's answering the question. Is it like super fast? Is it like super fast? It's, it's like I'm googling yeah. you right now. I'm googling my mom as we speak. There's like all oh, there's like 150,000 results. <laughs> Oh my God, Mom! <laughs> Who knew? Uh, <laughs> no, the web the web's pretty quick here. Um, but you were getting bored with my answer, weren't you? I hate your answers. <laughs> your answers, because we do this. Uh, we've been doing a lot of Q and As. As a matter of fact, this we're about to launch into so many Q and As. This Friday and Saturday, we're at the IFC Center. We agreed, and there's this video where we proclaim it on YouTube that we're going to be at every single screening, Friday and Saturday night, opening at the IFC Center in New York City. And it was that's seven screenings a day. We sold out, yeah, it's 14 screenings. We sold out eight of them. They added another screen. So now we're doing 14 screenings per day. That's, for that's all you Google employees who don't know math, <laughs> that's 28 <laughs> screenings in two days. So that's a lot of Q&As. That's a lot of A's. Yeah. <laughs> the same cues, lots of different A's. You just got to mix it up each time. I know. I know. We're going to be like Bob Dylan. We're just going to start to make up answers yeah. to stuff. After a while, people just won't even want to see you live anymore. Just wait till we go electric. <laughs> 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 All right, ask us a question. All right. We're going to lie. Right. So we're going to lie in this answer. Yeah, Mike, you, like Bob Dylan in his early work. We're just mm -hmm. going to make up a lore. Of okay. How, how we Let's made try it. Film. Let's try it. Okay, okay. We've never done this. Try it. Yeah, yeah, I like okay. that. So Mike, you mentioned. Uh, this, the one-man show was very successful. What is and your people, Bob Dylan? Are you stoned? Yeah, <laughs> I'm stoned. I'm playing the part. We're doing a bit. He's not stoned. Have you seen? Don't no, look. no. But I mean, like, he just doesn't care. Like, give me a cigarette. Does anyone have a cigarette? Does anyone smoke at Google? Does anyone? <laughs> does, anyone <laughs> does anyone have, have a, cigarette a cigarette for real? Come on. There must be one. Person. Somebody has a cigarette. Come on. Secretly, I know that you'll get fired the moment that people <laughs> discover that you smoke cigarettes. There's like a hundred. Somebody smoke. Raise your hand if you have a cigarette. Be honest. Really Just lot. say that it was there for a go. friend. There we go. Can, can we have us borrow a cigarette? <laughs> oh, wait. You might be 47. <laughs> uh, can we get people... a camera on this guy? <laughs> can we get a camera on this guy? That'll be a good cutaway. Thank, Thank you, you very much. God bless you. <laughs> All right. 
So, Mike, you mentioned when the show, One Man Show was a success, uh -huh. and people were pressuring you, saying, hey, this could be a movie. Uh -huh. When did it occur to you to say, hey, this might actually work as a movie, instead of my friends just saying, hey, you should make a movie? Uh, just so that I answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> He, he actually had a, he had a dream, and in the dream, any longer. there was a talking dog. I had a dream there was a talking dog, and it was, uh, it was, uh... Wait, what was the question? The question was, when do we think it could be a movie? <laughs> yeah, versus people just saying, hey, you have a show, it could be a movie. You I actually know, I actually know when I thought it could be a movie. I could answer for me. Mike, yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Well, there, somebody, somebody suggested that, that, you, that, it, that the film had a very traditional structure where you, what you've got in the film is a guy who has, a lot, who, who has um, increasing anxiety over, he, he's in this relationship, he isn't sure if he should stay with his girlfriend, they've been together for years, he's not sure what to do, super relatable situation. And, um, and uh, he's also, he's, trying, he's in his 20s, he's trying to be a comedian, it's not going so great, and he's not doing anything much about either of these things. And, and, and somebody suggested where well, you could just kick the thing off at his sister's engagement party. His sister gets engaged. People start asking him, so what are you doing with your girlfriend? Like, what's going on with your life? So creating anxiety so he could have the first sleepwalking incident. That would kick the thing off in a very like, normal movie sort of way. And when I heard that, I was like, right, you could do that. And then you, would, you could build just to, to basically, finally he, I mean, this isn't such a spoiler because it's on the poster and all. He <laughs> ends up jumping out a window. He jumps through. Like, there's a series of increasingly spectacular uh, sleepwalk incidents as he doesn't deal with the stuff in his life, his anxiety gets expressed through these uh, funny and spectacular like sleepwalk incidents culminating with him nearly dying, jumping through a window and nearly dying. And, uh, and then he'll have to decide like, what to do about the girl, basically. And um, it seemed like once I saw that, I was like, okay, it's a very traditional structure and, and it, could be a, it could be a film because the way I think about these things is so math-based in a way. Like, <laughs> like if I can see the structure of it, I feel like, okay, then that it could be, that it could be real. Yeah, like a sentence diagram. You can see the little parts where That's exactly right. Like, I need that. And, and when I'm making stories for the radio show, in fact, like, there's a lot of, like, there's diagramming. So. And speaking of the sort of physicality of the movie, Mike, there's a lot of, I mean, you're a, primarily a, a stage performer. This movie, you got a chance to just be chased around and run through fields and jump out of windows and crash off of furniture. Was it weird being a, f a physical specimen in front of the camera versus where your stage show you're much more kind of subdued? And yeah, it was a lot more uh, physically rigorous than my everyday life. Uh, <laughs> I had to sprint through that field so many times, just over and over and over again. And then what was worse is that I had to do it fall because, as you can see in the scene, I fall in a field that's not a set on Paramount's lot <laughs> with a field. It's an actual field that I fall into. I jump up and then I, I jog over to where there's playback and I watch what I just did and I say, it's good or it's not good and then usually it's not good and then, <laughs> and then we do it again. And there was a lot of, I was amazed at the amount of falling, yeah. It was so much falling. It was in uh, running, just so much physical. And the, the other thing is that I make my uh, topless debut in this film. This is <laughs> something rarely talked about, but I feel comfortable talking with you Google folks about it because you guys Google the word topless all the time. Um, <laughs> I thought it was a good Google joke. I thought that was much better than it was received. Uh, shame on you, Google. Uh, no, it's uh, Mike Birbiglia. If you Google Mike Birbiglia topless, this movie comes up uh, because we were shooting that scene where I sleepwalk down the hallway after I have this certain dream. And I was like, you know, it, it's just funnier and grittier and more real if I don't have my shirt on and I <laughs> and I swear this is gonna sound ridiculous and not real but like I swore to myself internally when I started acting like in college that I would never do a topless scene <laughs> I swear to God I'm not even making that up really like I think why? that's a decision Wait, every why? actor is that makes your, your writer for a different contract? usually it's actresses who make yeah. that decision but in this case I'm just so self-conscious and I was like, oh, I could, I could be an actor, but I would never take my shirt off, and certainly not my pants off. Uh, 
But, uh, but I did, just because I got so swept up in like what's good for the movie. Well, the other thing is that you're the director of the movie, so yeah. you would have to tell yourself to get over this mental hump that you'd have to take your shirt Yeah, I had to say to myself, hey, Mike, it's cool, be cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right, I don't know. And then, and then Mike was like, nah, baby, be cool. And then I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I, the crew was just staring at me, having this conversation with myself. But you can tell when you watch the film that the directing was done by a black man from the 70s, so. <laughs> It wasn't a black voice. <laughs> that was not a black man's voice. That Whatever. was just a, a cool high school guy's voice. Okay. All right. Point that was taken. Like a guy I went Point to, taken. to high school with. You both, uh, you both started your careers before the web and social media really took off. Um, and Ira, in particular, you show is a pretty good example of how traditional media can leverage the web to expand your audience. And yes, yes. You gave a, I read an interview with, with you a, a few years ago. You said that when you started the podcast, your weekly audience didn't change, stayed around 1.8 million or so. 1.8 million on the radio each week. But the podcast yeah. added another half million. Yeah, now skewed, even more, now it's like 700,000. 700,000, yeah. and yeah. that skews overwhelmingly towards younger people who may not even listen to the radio at all. Yes, yeah. The only people who don't listen to his show <laughs> are that lady and that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna say, do you have a preference for how people listen to your show, or does it, is it all good? Oh, I don't care. I mean, I mean, the, the thing, the, the correct answer is it's all good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, bro. Was that good? Yeah, it was good. It yeah. Killed. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I don't care. That's good. It, it's you saying it's all good, bro. Is going to be an internet meme in about thirty minutes. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's such a. <laughs> I think it's such a corny meme, though, that's like, but anyway, all right. Yeah, so, all no. good, bro. Yeah. Um, but you won't repeat it. Now that you know <laughs> what these Google people can do to you. <laughs> you're like a meme. I got to find out what that is. <laughs> uh, but Mike, sort of the flip side of that is uh, a lot of comedians now sort of build their entire careers on, sorry. Mike, Bob, Dylan. Um, they, build, they build their whole careers on, on the web and social media. Um, but you're... You're the only person I've ever seen who gets less sexy when you put a cigarette in your mouth. <laughs> Just do that again. <laughs> like, you, you have no air of menace. Do it again. It's crazy. Like, anybody else looks cooler. It's the... What are you doing wrong? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what do you mean? Is it so cool? <laughs> They're never going to put this in because it's Google and it's a cigarette and cigarettes are evil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was saying, in a lot of ways, the, the one-man show uh, is sort of the antithesis of the kind of 140-character joke structure that a lot of comedians build their careers on now. Yeah. Um, do you feel strongly about how the web or social media is affecting comedy in the comedy world? It's certainly affecting it. Uh, whether it's positive or negative, there's really no way to know for like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a... <laughs> wow, it's not affecting it if it's good or bad. There's no way to know. <laughs> that is the most non-committal answer I've ever heard to anything. That could be the answer to any question. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the, the oil situation and the price of gas? And is it going to be going up? There's no way to know. <laughs> could be good, could be bad. There's no way to know. I, I just think, like, just for Rob Delaney's tweets alone, the internet yeah. is just, it's, it's worth, worth having it. an internet. Like, like, just, like, and have you ever seen his show? Like, like I follow him on Twitter constantly. Everyone yeah. follows him. No, he's amazing on Twitter, but, but yeah. Yeah, I'm no. Saying, like, but I, who knows what he's comedy's like. Comedy's good. Up. Twitter's good for comedy um, in the sense that uh, comedians are able to find their audience, which is good. Um, and... I don't know. Like, it seems good. I, I, I don't, I honestly. You've been marketing to an audience over the internet. You had your yeah. secret public journal. On yeah, the I have my blog, my secret public journal, and uh, I've been writing on that since it is called my secret public journal <laughs> dot com. And, uh, and I, I was, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I guess so. I think the answer is yes. I mean, like, I, I started doing comedy when I was 19, and I'm 34 now, so I guess I've been doing it for like 15 years. And 
When you I are totally pulling out the math for these engineers. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how you're catering the whole thing to this crowd. I'm just doing it to process it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> But I've been doing it for um, a number of years, and uh, and uh, and yeah, I, even when I started out, you know, in '97 or '98, like I was, um, I would keep an email list. Uh, from after my show. And did you have like, how many people did you have on that list? Well, the there period? was only, like, only like 10 people had email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> it was very few. Yeah. But no, it was a small group. Honestly, it was like, I was so delusional starting out. First of all, I was terrible. So it was like, who would want to be on my email list? Second of all, uh, I, I mean, after like two or three years, I had like probably 300 people on my email list spread across the United States. So like <laughs> if I had a show in like Pierre, uh, there's probably one person on the list. Uh, so it, it's not, it wasn't that effective in that sense. But then, you know, as that list grew and I, you know, it, 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 beca it became this thing where people started to come out to see me on purpose as opposed to going to see the comedy show, yeah. um, which was always my goal because I wasn't, I was not uh, immediately uh, uh, a, a comedian who you'd want to see because I was kind of soft-spoken and I was kind of like, uh, kind of strange. I wasn't that mean. Like I feel like mean comedy was always selling really well when I started out. Like people would get up on stage and they're like, you're fat, you're gay, I'm out of here, you know? And I'd be, people would be like, this guy's a genius. Yeah. I'd be like, I don't think he's a genius. I don't know. I don't get it. But uh, I, that's never my, uh, that was never my sense of humor. Like I, I was always a little fat and a little gay. I, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so like. That should be the title of your next one man show. Yeah, yeah, a little fat and a little gay. And, uh, but neither at the same time. <laughs> All right. Um, um, did did yeah. you just stop my joke? I, I think that's what just happened. I was going to say, okay. we have um, no, no, but I actually have an answer. I have an answer okay. for the question. The so, question so of how did the internet that affect thing, comedy? The internet thing, yeah. We're still on that? <laughs> I guess so. We okay. got sidetracked, but I think we're going to end strong. Bring it, bring it, bring it, so, bring it. So cut to um, now, and you know, I have like 150, or a thousand Twitter followers, and, and the, I think some of the first people who signed up for my email list are probably Twitter followers now, and that, that audience has kind of evolved uh, as, you know, and, and like me on Facebook and all that stuff. And, and so I get, you know, in terms of getting an audience that likes what you do, if, you, if what you do is really specific, I think the internet is really good. The same way that, like, people are always like, Oh, like they make fun of people for going on dating sites, and I'm like, well, why would you make fun of? Like, you're just saying like things that you might be compatible with, and then those people are saying what they might be compatible with, and and then that might work out. You know what I mean? Like, it's actually very logical. Um, it, it's like being set up by a friend, except the friend is a computer, because that's our new friend in this <laughs> in this era that we're in. But. Um, yeah, and so I feel like with um, with artists, it's like the it's like a dating the internet is like a dating site for artists with their fans. Nice. Um, well, we have a few two audience mics here. We can take a few questions. Um, so if you want to ask a question of either person here, you can feel free to line up. Have we sold the movie hard enough while we're waiting? For oh yeah, we love the movie. <laughs> the movie's really funny. Uh, it's great. I watched it do last you, night. Do you guys feel sold on the movie based on what's happened so far? I felt light. <laughs> so? I felt light. So. so let me sell you on the movie. <laughs> the movie's really funny. The movie is really funny. And we, it's a real labor of love. And, um, and, it, and, it's, and it's something that you can bring your like, teenagers to or your parents. Like there's one curse word in the whole movie. Um, there's nothing in it that's like excessively violent or shocking but it's I think a pretty compelling story that we're telling and with consistent laughs in it and, and it's that we showed it at Sundance and South by Southwest and the response from audiences has been 
really consistently lovely and warm and and I feel like that's why Ira and I are like here at Google today and it's why we're going on talk shows and why we're talking about it a lot because when Ira and I don't like stuff that we do, we don't promote we it. We don't tell people <laughs> yeah, about yeah. it. We're just like, let's pretend that never happened. Um, and um, and so the, yeah, we, we really urge you to go see it. Like like my goal was that like, I hoped that we could make a movie that would have the feeling of of, of a, the best stories on the radio show, where you just kind of get like pulled into it and, and it would be funny in parts and be emotional and and, uh, and and truthfully through a lot of the process of making the film it did not have that quality, um, and only in the course of like editing it and showing it to audiences and remaking it did it start to feel like something from the radio show and and I feel like it really it, it really does and um, so. Great. I think we have our first question over here. Hi. Um, I listened to the original Sleepwalk with Me, uh, well, one of the one of the original iterations of it, and it's just such a come to the closer to the thing. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's gonna help. It's, it's such a dear story to you, and it involves a lot of people you're really close with, and you go into a lot of detail about them. I was wondering about the casting process and how surreal that must have been to try and find your family and your ex-girlfriend in, in this sea of actors. I, I'd love to hear more about that and how you went about finding these people. Well, Lauren was the first person who uh, we asked to This is Lauren Ambrose, who plays his girlfriend. Um, and uh, the yeah, my that was my wife's idea. My wife, Jenny, um, who's very close to like every part of the process of all of my projects since we've met, is. Um, we were always talking about like it's really Im how it's really important that whoever plays the girlfriend in this film that plays Abby has to be has to emanate strength and humor because if she doesn't, then we'll feel bad for her at the end inevitably, and we don't want to feel bad for her. We want to feel happy for both of these characters that the things are going to be better for them both, and and so. My wife is a big fan of Six Feet Under, and I didn't. I never had seen it because I w couldn't afford cable when it was on, uh, and and so I caught up with it a little bit, and I was like, oh yeah, she's perfect. And so I invited her to a show that I was doing at Town Hall, and I, her and her husband came, and and we struck up a conversation, and um, and she came to some of the readings. She did about four or five readings of it over the course of a year, so she was. That was done. She was always great in the readings. And then Carol was similar. Carol was someone I'd met in the casting process of a pilot I did for CBS in 2008, um, where, we, where we were talking about um, casting her. And it didn't, it, it didn't work out for like a variety of reasons. There were a lot of chefs in that process. Um, but Carol and I- It's crazy that you can meet Carol Kane. Like it's, I know. I feel like yeah. The fact that we know Carol Kane to me yeah. is really yeah. No, it's really wild because like when they we were in the casting process for that pilot, they were like, "What about Carol Kane?" And I said that just that. I was like, "We could ask Carol Kane to do this," and they were like, "We can ask anybody." And I was like, "Okay." And we sent her the script, and she really liked it. And and then she and I became friends, and uh, had just kept saying like, "Let's do something together," because I I just think she, her sense of comedy is so unique and what she brings to it is so special it's like what we wrote on the page is is like this and then what she does is like this you know and and so we'll we'll be indebted for her the thing is like forever. with all the casting we didn't try to make them be like the real people like they don't physically look True. like them and and the parents especially are very different than than Mike's real parents and uh, and that's why we didn't we had them part of, part of the reason we had uh, fake names, Matt Pendemiglio, not Mike Birbiglia, and yeah. Linda Pendemiglio, and all that. Because we wanted a nod to the fact that it's autobiographical, but not to say this is a, do a documentary. Basically. It's funny because I think the weird, the person who the whole thing was the weirdest for was Mike's girlfriend, who the movie is about. She ex came, yeah. she, his ex girlfriend, who, who came and saw the film after it was done. She saw it at BAM. We did this screening, and so it's like. We're in the BAM Opera House, and it's 1,500 people or 2,000 people, whatever that thing holds, and afterwards, uh, she came. I saw. I mean, I was there, and she like came up to you, and, and like, it, like it's such. A, I think she had the weirdest experience, much weirder than yours, because you had like lived through every stage of filming it. But can you imagine like your ex boyfriend like makes a movie about your relationship, <laughs> depicting actual things that happened, and then you're at a movie theater, and like there it is, this like period of your life, 
depicted by incredibly skilled actors shot by like a great cinematographer. It's like for her it was so weird and she was so teary and like so moved. It was really an, an amazing thing, um, I think, for her. I mean, hearing her talk about it afterwards was really interesting. And then the rest of the casting um, was by Jennifer Houston, who is a, cast, a brilliant casting director who casts girls on HBO and who I've known for a long time and I've auditioned for unsuccessfully for years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. I uh, have another one. Hi. Uh, you're both doing tons of Q&As and press junkets and screenings. What do you do to relax or cool off once you've finished your 14 screenings a day? Um, we don't, actually. I mean, I'm going to go back and, and go back to writing this week's radio show because th it's not clear. We, we've recorded two different versions of the top of the show, and, um, and one should be by nature three minutes, and one should be by nature like, like neither one is going to work, basically. <laughs> Um, so, so I'm going to just go back to my job. And then you haven't really been working. You haven't had any time <laughs> off at all. You seem so burned out. You seem burned out. <laughs> <laughs> nice glasses, loser. <laughs> Are you asking that because you can take us out and get us ecstasy or something? I can't comment. Memed. <laughs> You're going to get memed on that because you can... <laughs> Take us out and get us to ecstasy? You don't think they're going to meme that? Then you don't know what memes even are. I was a semiotics student. I didn't know what memes are. I knew memes before they were on the internet. <laughs> That's going to be meme. <laughs> so the question is what? He wants to know. <laughs> The question is like, what do we do for fun? We just party. You know what I mean? Like, the, we have a Hollywood lifestyle. We are guys. We are guys that like five nights a week. We are trolling the bars. We are out on the town. We see Broadway musicals. Do you think that's the party lifestyle? <laughs> Who told you that? No, I turned it gay at the end. <laughs> I started out being a, like kind of an entourage thing, and then I made it like a glee thing at the end. <laughs> I, uh, no, we, um, I don't do anything for fun except hang out with my wife and our cat, Ivan. That's like the best thing we do. We watch That's movies. actually the truth. Yeah, no, I, that's all we do. My wife and I go see movies. This weekend we saw Ruby Sparks, which is really good. We saw Beasts of Southern Wild. We saw Hello, I Must Be Going. There's a lot of really good indie films out right now. We saw Compliance. I see a ton of movies, and I hang out with my wife and our cat. Um, okay, Thanks so much. this is for Mike. I know that your brother Joe Bags is in a lot of your stand-up. Is he in the actual movie, like making a cameo? Because that would be awesome. No, and there's a reason he didn't, which is, and he's one of the co-writers on the film and has a lot of hilarious lines in the film. He, um, we were going to use him in the wedding scene, uh, where it's like my family, but we, but so many people come up to him thinking that he's me, because we look very similar. That we, that you know, and they, it's even worse on the big screen. It's like even if you catch a glimpse of him, you go, wait, is that the protagonist? And then it takes you out of it. And so that was why he wasn't in there. Okay. Thanks. I think but we... look out for Joe Bags in future films. <laughs> Joey Bag of Donuts. Uh, she's referencing it out. By the way, for people who have no idea what she's talking about. There's a, a track on my album, My Secret Public Journal Live, uh, which I think is called Joey Bag of Donuts, or Joe, Joe Bags, Joey Bags, about my, about my brother Joe. And it's a funny story, and you can listen to it. <laughs> you can rip it for free off the internet, because you guys are good at that. <laughs> uh, last question. Thanks. Hi. This is a question for both of you. How have you found your storytelling styles changing as you've grown? And done, you know, been in the industry more and more. Well, Ira's grown a lot longer than I have. Right. <laughs> well, that's true. That's not even a joke. Is that, is that but old? I also started is... later than you did. Like you, I feel like you're much more precocious than, than I than I am. Like you, you were more successful. You, you know, in your twenties, like you, you were you were hugely successful in your twenties, whereas I was kind of a late bloomer. But anyway, um, like like for, for for me, I feel like when I listen when I listen to earlier work, I can hear myself trying so hard to make the stories have significance, and 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 listening to recordings of myself, listening to old pieces where I'm just trying so hard to make the stories have like meaning and importance, has made me just back the way the hell off on that, and and uh, and be and just say less about them, like and and let them talk for themselves more. 
Um, I mean, on the radio, like when you're telling a story, like you want to move the plot forward, but then also periodically someone in the story has to say, like, here's what I'm trying to say with this story. Here's what the story means. Here's the point. And, and, and early on, I was so worried that the stories didn't have a point. I would just totally, it was like pouring syrup on the stories. When I listened to some of the early episodes of the show, I felt kind of embarrassed. Um, and now, you're so indifferent when you speak on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> that you that people I, I it's mumble. comical people are just, you know people hear you go act one holocaust <laughs> act two somalia uh yeah that's a good point <laughs> act three aids in africa and you're and people are like isn't it more important than that like isn't it more dramatic than the way that you're just kind of throwing those lines away and you're like yeah. well i guess so you know I, wait is that your imitation <laughs> it fell away at the end, and it just blended into me speaking uh, with a high voice. What about you? I feel, I feel like your whole, your whole situation has gotten so big in your storytelling in the last four or five years. By my situation, you mean? Your skills, your massive skills. <laughs> Are we fighting? No, we're having comical repartee. Okay. Feels a little like fighting. <laughs> Shows you care. Act one, we fight. <laughs> Act two, we make up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was the question? Um, I'm just kidding. I know the question is how do we change the storytellers or evolve the storytellers? Oh, yeah. yeah sure. That's a good question. Um, Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, when you guys get finished, I'm going to answer this one. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just thought it was funny because he goes, thank you. <laughs> it didn't allow for me to answer. Uh, I hope they edit this. <laughs> um, that's what the opening shot should be. <laughs> the opening right, shot should just be a, wherever you are. Can we, go in, okay. can we just go in a, a tight single me going, I hope they edit this. <laughs> and then it's unedited. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, add the cig they'll add the cigarette in there, too, at the end, too. Yeah. <laughs> you do that um, with cigarette? Oh, my mom is going to be so ashamed of the cigarette thing. Mom, mom, mom. <laughs> I'm not smoking. I'm doing it as a joke. Well, it's not lit. Yeah. But she doesn't even understand how cigarettes work. <laughs> <laughs> We got Mom, I'm we kidding. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so speaking for Mr. Babiglia. No, no, no. I, <laughs> no, I, 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 I was when I started out. I was just doing jokes. I was, I was modeling myself after uh, Jerry Seinfeld and uh, Stephen Wright and a lot of observational comedians who I really admire. And then o over the years, like I, I, I started between like performing at the Moth in 2003 and and. Um, just doing these longer sets, like another. I got booked at a ton of colleges starting out because no one else would book me, and colleges have really low standards. So they they're just like, we need someone to stand in the coffee house for an hour uh, who's an adult, and uh, and and so I performed. And you can perform for like an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and a lot. And I had in order to fill the time, a lot of times I would just tell more and more stories. And what I found was I was like. Well, this is just, these are actually, be I'm better at this. I think this is something that happens a lot of times with, with, uh, with artists or people uh, in, you know, in all fields, is they, they start on one path and they realize, oh, I'm actually better at this other thing. And I think what I found was that when I was telling stories, there was more passion in, in, in my delivery and as a result, more passion from the audience coming back at me because I cared about what I was talking about, as opposed to, I feel like there's, right now, we're witnessing kind of a post-Seinfeld, and I love Seinfeld, but like a post-Seinfeld era of, it, it's not observational comedy anymore because observational comedy has become ubiquitous and it's in TV ads and billboards, and it's like everything is a joke. Everything's an observational joke. I feel like comedians have gone the other way between like Louis C.K. and Mark Maron and Maria Bamford, and, and even in the in the movie realm like Judd Apatow, like the um, where it's become more personal and more more specific. Um, and and I think that that's sort of the um, I don't know that that's the direction that I went in, and I, I just find it to be. I'm, I'm able to connect with people more and by telling stories.
And then, and then meeting Ira was great because he, he just, um, you know, when I met Seth Barish, that was a really Seth big Barish deal. Seth directed your one-man shows. directed the one-man shows. Um, that was really helpful for me developing longer stories and longer pieces. So my one-person shows are, um, have a, more of an arc to them. And then when I met Ira, it really got me focused on elements of storytelling that I hadn't considered. Like if you watch Ira, and this is a good place to say this because people are watching this online, there's this incredible YouTube series of clips of Ira talking about storytelling and how to tell a story. And I feel like, you know, and it, it, it all, they all have to do with, you know, surprise. Those clips and, and are the craziest thing. That was this thing where somebody just came by the office to, to videotape for, as a training video for Al Gore's television channel of like, how do you tell a story? And I feel like on the internet, I am more famous for those videos than I am for my actual work. Like that's and that's how it should be because those videos are <laughs> really <laughs> exceptional versus your work. And um, um, yeah, no, so so yeah, but those so, videos but you, are great. When you and I, I started recommend working them. together, like like you were you were naturally going to stories which had more emotion and more 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 feeling in them anyway. So they weren't just funny stories, but funny stories with more just just a real story arc. And, and I was very lucky nice because I was able to work with. No, no, the Oracle. I was very lucky. I was very lucky. Being able to use I was very fortunate. I feel like I was very lucky. I feel like I was, I very, very yeah, I was, I like I was so blessed. Stories I feel, I feel so blessed that I'm able you know, you to work with these people <laughs> who are so brilliant. You, don't have, you can be a good editor. You can have a radio who show. Just met, who are just talent, exuding talent this with sense with of, of, of creativity and, then you're and really have natural arts to the stories. And we're just so lucky. You're just on the air talking to yourself. <laughs> I don't know. How does it end? How did how do you end these things? All right. I think you, and you can't end it any better than that, but I was just going to say, for people in the audience here, the movie opens at the IFC Center on 6th Avenue on Friday. Tickets are still available. They will be doing Q&As, as they said, at those shows. <laughs> So if and, like and then a, the week later, doing the same thing in Chicago and in Los Angeles. Los we'll Angeles. Be, I'm and sorry, is this thing? Uh, <laughs> we'll and I'm doing it in San Francisco, September second at the Embarcadero, and in at the theater in Berkeley. Does Google movie have an theater, office in uh, San Francisco area? Yeah, yeah. Are you joking? I mean, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> the uh, and and I'm going to be at the Embarcadero in San Francisco on that Sunday night, and on that Monday night, I'll be at the movie theater in Berkeley, California, which is one of, the, one of my favorite places to go. And so uh, you guys in the Google West Coast. They've already seen you now. They don't need to see you again. No, but they'll see the movie, and then also they'll see answers. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mike Birbiglia and Ira Glass. Oh, thanks. thanks, Brendan. It's my pleasure. Appreciate it. Take the man's hand.